Yes. All right. So I hope you had a pleasant lunch. Um, we are now all set up for the symposium on the state of the art in neurotechnology in real healthcare. So that is a big challenge for us. Um, BCI is an old idea. It has a history of more than three to four decades. But we actually don't see it really in our daily life routine in hospitals. Uh, we have seen some very nice demonstrations what um, brain-computer interface, brain control devices can uh, offer. But still, it's a big obstacle to translate what we are doing in the lab into something that is really uh, feasible in a daily life routine. So now we hear um, a number of talks um, covering all different aspects of how we can use brain-computer interfaces and neurotechnology in healthcare and rehabilitation. And we will start with Olga Bazanova, who is going to talk about individualized uh, neurofeedback um, for uh, modulating theta-beta. So welcome, Olga Bazanova. Is Olga Bazanova here? Or Elena Sapina? No? Um, is Alexei Tum Tumialis here? Maybe they are all in the other room. Maybe we... Uh <laughs> <laughs> yes. I asked them whether they are here, but they don't know them. I don't know them, so... Ah, okay. So what we can do is we can start to uh, discuss some questions that you have. So during the one and a half days, you probably have some questions now that um, run through your minds. Um, and it has a reason why you are here. So you're obviously interested in application in real life. So what kind of questions do you have? We have several experts here. So please. OK, thank you. Okay. Well, g general question. Uh, so you said that uh, in most hospitals you don't see BCI. So uh, in your opinion, what is like the uh, narrow point of this technology? Is it expensive? Is it difficult? To, why exactly? What's the, the most difficult part for it? So I, from my perspective, the mo main point is um, that it's not clear yet how ef efficient it is. So we have seen some meta-analyses that, uh, that suggest that BCI has uh, some meaningful effects, but, and I showed this from uh, Friedhelm Hummel's uh, meta-analysis that was just released uh, two months ago, that BCI, if you compare it with other um, technologies like robotic training or uh, behavioral physiotherapy, is not much, much better. So you have to think, okay, how much m money do you want to invest here? We can do this in, in studies, but we cannot do this if we go to the insurance and say, okay, you pay now for the same treatment, we expect the same results, but you have to pay 10 times that much. So what we have to do is exactly what you, what you say, we have to make it cheaper, and we have to make it easier to use, and then we have to show that it's efficient. So these three, three steps, and if we can show that this is actually better than anything else that we have now, the state of the art, in rehabilitation. Only then we will see that it spreads. And the negotiations with insurance is extremely difficult because they ask for certification. So you need to have certified medical devices. That is only the first step. Uh, for example, in Europe, you, ha you have to have a CE mark to be allowed to use it. And then the next step is you have to show efficacy. And the insurances will not say, okay, 30 patients are enough. They will ask for a couple of hundred uh, patients. So uh, to, to have these studies is extremely expensive and it takes time. So it's, it's clear that even if you have a very, very effective tool, it will take up to five to 10 years to really bring it into the hospital. Thank you. Uh, I wonder uh, about the future of uh, combination of simulation and uh, brain-computer interfaces that you mentioned, and also uh, about this possibility when you do epidural stimulation and recording, how much do you think it's, how close it's to, to uh, the real world at the moment? What do you think? I, I know that, yes, but no. So we use brain simulation already now in the context of clinical applications, for example, in the treatment of depression. 
and uh, we can also use it um, in terms of neuromodulation in chronic pain, for example, in central pain. So these are all uh, applications that are well established in the, in the hospital. But now the combination with BCI has mainly the, uh, the reason that, um, I mean, in my research, I want to probe the brain and I want to know, okay, what kind of brain oscillation or what kind of ac activity pattern is related to what brain function. And I think we can only reliably and reproducibly do this with brain simulation. Hmm? Uh, the well, I mean, the thing is, we all depend on our insurance system. So I'm using brain simulation to treat patients with depression or anxiety disorder, and if I want to use it in combination with BCI or if I want to collect some other data, I can only do it within uh, research uh, studies. And um, well, I hope they will be published sometimes, and then we can make an argument that, for example, using closed loop brain simulation is more effective than open loop simulation. But this is an ongoing process, and it will take several years. So, do we have now the speaker? <laughs> I don't want to, you know, take all the time because then they will have less time, obviously. So, more questions? Any questions here? So not, not only questions for me, there are you know, all the other speakers here in the room too. So if you have questions, please ask them. Alexei Osachi is here. You have another. So your prediction in uh, what uh, field will be like uh, the closest to the clinic uh, BCI is uh, in what field it's uh, the most important to implement BCI for now, uh, where it will be firstly implied, like widely. So for communication, it's pretty clear. If it works in complete locked-in state, we will see it there. For paralysis, um, assistive devices, I think, well, it is maybe more intuitive, but it's also um, more complicated. You ha have to put electrodes on the head and so on. So if there is remaining muscle activity, you or eye movements, pupil control, you will probably use these signals and not a BCI no? in a clinical setting. But what is really interesting is neuroplasticity. But here we need to understand more how we can use it on an individual level to induce plasticity that is really beneficial for function, for brain function or for motor function. And this is one of the big uh, yeah, challenges that we have to overcome now. Only if we show that it's efficient, then I think using a BCI on a regular basis makes really sense. So you will see now in the morning, uh, um, I mentioned it yesterday, there was a publication in Lancet Neurology where they implanted an e implantable ECOG grid. Um, and this patient could uh, move a whole whole body exoskeleton, and there is now a big discussion whether this is really what we need. When they asked the patient, he said, well, I haven't walked for many years now, and when I walked in the exoskeleton, I realized how tall I actually was, that he was taller than the other people, which he forgot when he was always in the wheelchair. So it makes, it has some effect, obviously, but the question is, is it worth it to open the skull, put it in, and then have this patient um, using this device, which can be only done under ve very controlled conditions. So you will see, if you check in the internet now, there are some videos from this publication, and the, the patient is controlling a wheelchair. But he's not controlling his own wheelchair because it's too, <laughs> too dangerous. He's just controlling a wheelchair, so he sits somewhere else, and then he controls the wheelchair. And this is the reality that we face, because these devices are not safe um, enough to have them completely controlled by the subjects if there is no safety measure. So they cannot really be used without any supervision. So, ah, okay, so, Pavel Bobrov. Ba Pavel will talk about the results of PCI-controlled exoskeleton in clinical trials, and I think uh, your publication with Alexander Frolov was public, uh, was also cited by, by the Lancet Neurology uh, paper that I just talked about. So uh, you are the pioneers of this work. Uh, greetings, uh, dear colleagues. So 
I think my presentation will somewhat continue the, the notes. No? The, the, okay. So today I'm presenting uh, work which, okay, which uh, was done by several uh, institutions, uh, and uh, this work was is it working? Uh, was nominated for the BCI award uh, this year in Graz. Oh, we didn't make it to the first uh, three places, but we made it to the short list uh, due to the fact that uh, our study included a lot of patients, which I would uh, talk about right now. So these uh, trials uh, are designed to test uh, the efficiency of a BCI-controlled uh, exoskeleton used for post-stroke rehabilitation. Uh, the design of this study goes back to 2013, so it's really uh, a long work. And uh, here is the uh, what we finally came up with. So this is the protocol. First of all, the patient is screened. Then, uh, if uh, the patient meets the inclusion criteria, which I would not talk about right now, uh, then the patient, uh, and of course, if he agrees to test uh, this, uh, to take this procedure, he is. Uh, uh, his uh, motor and cognitive function are assessed with uh, different uh, clinical scales and maybe optionally with uh, biomechanical recordings and functional MRI analysis. After that, the, he, the patient undergoes uh, uh, rehabilitation, of course, including all the routine and necessary treatment he has to receive and also uh, with addition of the brain con computer interface. So the next... Uh, uh, it's. Uh, Somewhat, this is somewhat a limitation of our study because we uh, can only um, uh, make so much procedures because uh, there are formal regulations on how long the patient can stay in clinic. Uh, even for these advanced institutions uh, which have uh, the proper research license and can do this kind of work. So we are limited to this uh, uh, shorter term uh, and our colleagues from uh, Europe and uh, Singapore, Japan, they come up with uh, the studies uh, with uh, longer periods, which uh, I think is uh, very important, but here it's uh, uh, eight, eight or ten days is what we can have. And after the, after the patient has received his uh, treatment, he's uh, also assessed uh, uh, with uh, clinical scales, his motor and cognitive functions are tested, and if he had undergone back me back mechanical recordings and functional MRI analysis, so uh, he also uh, takes uh, these procedures too. So uh, here is the procedure setup. It's uh, somewhat a final version of the exahand uh, designed uh, by Android Techniques uh, for uh, Piragov Institute. So the patient, uh, but here is uh, our engineer, so he looks at the screen. Uh, there are visual cues on what uh, uh, task he should do. He should either either relax or imagine a uh, left or right uh, palm expansion. And uh, if uh, the classifier recognizes his uh, attention and he that he is doing this actually, the exoskeleton is expanding his spastic hand. While uh, if uh, there is no recognition, the hand returns to its initial stage gradually. There also is uh, a visual feedback uh, when this uh, circle used for gaze fixation also changes uh, color uh, when uh, the recognition is correct. We uh, found that negative feedback is uh, not good, so uh, earlier for healthy subjects this uh, would become red if the recognition is uh, somewhat wrong. So if the classifier response doesn't uh, correspond to the task at hand. And also there was no feedback during the relaxation for obvious reason because it's hard to, it is hard to relax when you have to do something and see and receive feedback. Uh, so here is uh, a diagram which uh, uh, with, with updated statistics on how many patients we actually screened. So there were more than uh, 600 patients screened and as you can see most of them didn't meet the inclusion criteria because they had uh, some maybe cognitive uh, uh, disorders, aphasia, uh, depression, uh, clinical condition which wouldn't allow him to undergo this procedure or clinical conditions which would require some more urgent procedures. So as you can see here, it's clear that the technology is definitely not for everyone because uh, there, there are also 
uh, a lot of more uh, problems that this patient have. Uh, not so the, maybe restoring the hand function is not uh, the problem which should be addressed uh, at first. Uh, and then we had this main group of more than 100 patients, uh, of, and uh, 11 patients discontinued. Patients have discontinued this uh, BCI treatment uh, due to di different reasons. We have a control group where the, we measured EEG, and uh, the robot expanded uh, his hand uh, passively, but he, the any patients did not have to imagine anything. And also a control group, uh, additional control group with a. Uh, something that you can really call a uh, routine post-stroke uh, treatment uh, in Russia. It was in Matishi Clinic. So uh, here I have to say that all these institutions which are uh, allowed to do this kind of work, so, so the, the, the control to patients, uh, they didn't receive any procedure, so they were all, all only screened, and that's why a uh, uh, usual clinic could do this. So uh, this, all these institutions are advanced, and they also usually use all means possible to help the patient. And that's why, of course, we really can get the results where it's hard to distinguish the BCI impact uh, into rehabilitation, adding the BCI to the rehabilitation, uh, compared to other mm, techniques, which uh, there are plenty of techniques. So that's why uh, a quite large statistics is really required. And uh, this table shows that our groups were uh, more or less uniform according to these different parameters uh, to uh, gender, to the s stroke uh, offset and age, and etc. And uh, the main result here is that uh, when we got this much statistics, we could really show that adding the, this brain-computer interface training to uh, our rehabilitation really in in increases significantly the uh, motor output uh, due measured by these uh, scales, and uh, uh, which is more interesting, it uh, does uh, in tends to increase this output uh, in a proximal domain, even for the patients with uh, 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 with the severe lesions or the patients who had stroke uh, long ago. Uh, I think. They didn't, of course, uh, get uh, these patients, it's not shown here, but these patients did not get this prominent result in a uh, uh, distal domain, but it's uh, really hard to expect to rehabilitate uh, or to achieve very significant results for the patients with severe lesions or a uh, long time after stroke, uh, after 10 days. It, it's, it's no miracle, no, no known technology would probably do this uh, so relevantly for the, a lot of patients. But anyway, uh, our results do show that adding this brain-computer interface could really facilitate the uh, rehabilitation. And uh, of course, uh, this shows that, this doesn't show that you can just uh, uh, say that, yeah, this is the main tool for rehabilitation. This is an assistive technology, which if uh, made available, uh, could uh, really facilitate the rehabilitation. E and, uh, uh, the way I see it, it the, the best opportunity is to uh, add the, uh, allow the people to, or allow the clinician to choose the methodology, to choose uh, if they can use this brain computer interface. So the more statistics here, the better. So here you can see this biomechanical outcome for people with mild paresis. Their movement really increased. Uh, the tremor is gone. It's the velocity of the movement he had to do. And uh, for the patients with severe uh, lesions, uh, they had um, uh, th the movement appeared. So the rehabilitation triggered this movement. And unfortunately, I, I do not have so much time. The last thing I would say that uh, really we observed that uh, a lot of times the patients uh, show the ability to control this system comparable to the healthy subjects. And uh, the higher cognitive status uh, tends to uh, really predict uh, their ability to control this BCI. And uh, I will not, I, I don't have time to say about uh, EEG analysis, so uh, if you have uh, questions, or I might answer them, but I think I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions, if they are short. Any questions? Yes. 
great talk and it was a great work. Uh, I have a question. Uh, did you look into the group which would use the exoskeleton but didn't use the BCI? Sometimes, an interesting question, sometimes these uh, people do show, uh, uh, let's say for simplicity, myrhythm response uh, for this stimulation. There are not a lot of them. And what is interesting, uh, if we use a technique called uh, transfer learning with Riemann and covariance of matrix analysis, the idea I recently uh, heard at the GRASS conference and I liked very much, uh, there are some patients who tend to uh, produce the sim the, the, who, are, who are similar to those uh, who control BCI good and to those who are healthy subjects. So they do produce this marine desynchronization at least. But uh, these data are really hard to summarize. But yes, so, so the, the groups are, are very non-uniform in terms of how they react to rehabilitation. It's really hard to, it's, it's another problem of all, all these clinical trials and for everyone who enters the clinic because uh, finding this patients to make some or less uniform group, it's really, it's almost impossible. So they're very individual, but they do respond. Sometimes they do respond to this positive. Uh, you mean the feedback? Uh, this study did not include the group without uh, feedback, but without with motor feedback, imagery. But with, with exoskeleton. I, I think uh, I, I, do, I cannot answer this using my data. I think it probably would work, but worse. But you you should really have a lot of statistics to That's prove true, that. That's true. Yes, and it's really hard to find as you screen six hundred forty nine things. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very hard. Yes. If we have opportunity, we want to test this, but I don't know. It's really hard to find. I, so I don't it, have it, the answer for this question, which would. Yes. Yes, actually, we have a control group in a study in Tübingen that we uh, published in 2013. And the difficulty is really you need to offer the same amount of movements because otherwise people will say, well, pff, the hand wasn't moved. So it needs to move. And you need to instruct the patient also to imagine or to attempt to move yeah. the hand. Yeah. And then you cannot rule out that it actually coincides. So actual motor imagery and the movement of the, of the exoskeleton. So you need a lot of trials to statistically really show that this contingent effect on the exoskeleton really did something to I think you, will, you would uh, really e even need more than we did here. Yes, definitely. Unfortunately, yes. yes. But well, yes. the BCI field has to answer the question, obviously, but it's OK. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think uh, if there is no, there was one question. Try to make it short. Yeah, but actually, you already mentioned it. I just wanted to say, how did you control that patients did the same amount of movements uh, in the control group? Otherwise, uh, like, how much could you say that it's it's BCI? What was the control? So just they had, did they have I the same physiotherapy in terms of dosage? I think uh, that uh, I, I can answer this question uh, the way. Well, in a way, we didn't have a trial protocol, so it's hard to I estimate how, how many times the exoskeleton should have opened because he had to imagine and maintain this state for uh, some time, which is more a hard task for the patient. But I can say that. Uh, on average, uh, the patients with uh, passive therapy, they might uh, have received even more movements because uh, they, the, the, the exoskeleton moved no matter what. And, if, uh, and uh, some, often the patients, uh, they have uh, um, a lower ability to control the BCI, so sometimes the hand would not expand at all. So in terms of uh, qu quantity of movements, I think the placebo group or, or should I, I'd better say the control one group received even more movements and uh, still we have a significant result. So I think what matters is a motor imagery, of course, and uh, what we uh, uh, see for a analysis, at least for uh, groups of patients we could identify, it is really important to combine their intention with the movement, actually. Maybe then he has to make less movement, but <laughs> it's, that's it's how I can answer this discussion. Questions. 
I mean, okay. I can add one, one sentence and then you can respond and then we have to go to the next one. So I did this for many years, like imagine and exoskeleton, I did this at, in the US. Um, and the patients actually improved in spasticity, but they didn't improve in Fugelmeier, and it had no meaning for their daily life, only when we combined it with some activities of daily living where they could transfer this into something that they would do afterwards for an hour. So that was very intense. They did BCI plus physiotherapy. Then we could see some improvement in Fugelmeier. But this is really, we need many more patients. What was the difference in Fugelmeier? Because, like, if it's less than six, it's not really clinically meaningful. So, how, how big it was? Uh, it, the, sh the slides sh show this, but uh, it's uh, oh. combined statistics. But uh, I think. Only the difference. He showed the delta, but not the actual value at the beginning. Yes. Uh, you mean what, what was. The if you show the table again, yeah. you're only showing the delta and not where they started from. Oh, yeah, of course. I, I don't have time to go into detailed statistics. Uh, hopefully, we can publish this. There are different groups of patients who start from low cases. Of course, they improve not so much. But uh, what I can tell, it's not shown here, but I showed this slide, uh, slide earlier in my earlier presentations. Uh, the uh, ratio of patients who achieved minimal clinically impo important difference was significantly higher in the BCI group. It was much higher than compared to this control one group. Uh, but of course, it's not uh, like they okay, they are completely rehabilitated, and they they really have to con to continue these trainings. And now we have uh, an article published about the long-term effect effect uh, of the patients who uh, repeatedly entered the hospitalization. Uh, and what I can say, the main idea is that they really achieve some level of improvement. Then they go home. They probably don't do anything. They uh, their level stays uh, and or maybe just goes a bit down but after they continue the training it, it grows up uh, it grows up a little bit uh, all i can say that this is all this rehabilitation thing uh, the patient has to continue the, to to try to do something for his whole, whole life it's not enough to just hospitalize them at once and there's no technology which would allow him to significantly and greatly improve well Maybe there are some individual cases, of course, uh, after 10 days. So okay, so I think we I need to say. stop here. It's a very uh, interesting discussion. And I think in the next years we will see uh, uh, many more uh, data. And I mean, if you look into uh, the Cos COSCA uh, review, the meta-analysis of PCI, the, main, the mean uh, effect is 5 to 11 points in the Fugelmeier, but they were also very heterogeneous. And uh, we just need more data. So now the next, um, the next talk is about TMS mapping uh, from Vadim Nikolin's lab. Um, Pavel Novikov will talk. And yeah, perfect. So um, uh, when he was presenting uh, the results of his study, um, showing that the upper limb is actually improving, although you are actually moving the fingers, this is also something that we could observe in our studies in Tübingen. And uh, what was predictive was actually whether the people had MEPs, motor evoked potentials, in the biceps and tri um, triceps. Uh, very difficult to assess because um, you need a lot of energy with the TMS, but there are different possibilities. For example, if you ask them to actively move the shoulder, and if, if you could get uh, MEPs, this was predictive of the response to the BCI, but it is interesting that it was mainly starting with uh, improved uh, movements in the upper limb, and then the fingers followed much later. But we could also see that EMG activity was somehow also restored. So I'm looking forward to hear your talk now. It's about TMS mapping software for quantitative analysis of TMS mapping results. So actually, our talk would be not about the BCI at the moment, but about the uh, way how we can measure the effect, uh, non directly for sure, uh, but it's uh, one of the way to measure also probably neuroplastic changes in the cortex. Uh, we are working with uh, TMS mapping, and here is just a 
demonstration of the software uh, helping researchers or clinicians to uh, assess the results of TMS mapping uh, at the moment. It's mostly TMS motor mapping, but we are also extrapolating it to uh, speech areas and we'll think it might be used for other uh, approaches like TMS EEG in, in the future. But it's, yeah, it's kind of for simple software for clinicians as it was uh, like, uh, thought about in the beginning and will just show its possibilities at the moment. So you, you don't need to use them any programming skills or whatever. It, like, it was thought to be used by their not only researcher but by the nurse or uh, doc, busy doctor uh, to have the results. So here is the uh, first version of the software and uh, at the moment we use uh, uh, different software, navigation softwares, Nextim, Localite, among others. We have to have uh, MRI, uh, so we have our own visualization of MRI. Uh, after that, you just uh, you'll, you'll have sessions, TMS sessions, and we have here we have special filter. We just made a special filter for TMS data. Here's a sessions of TMS we've already done. So at the moment, it's offline software. It might be used uh, only offline. Even we think about using it online in the future. So here is the stimulation points. Uh, and we had uh, two channels, so two EMG channels, but it can be also, uh, uh, yes, yeah, three, I'm sorry, three EMG channels. Uh, so you can, uh, after that, construct these uh, maps. So at the moment, it's just maps of the amplitude of uh, modern walk potentials, but it can be also latency or it can be other parameters. So we just choose the channel where, uh, and after that we visualize it uh, and uh, well, we can do it at the moment also in the individualized MRI version and also in the MNI version, so you can compare uh, different subjects or patients. Uh, and here is, yeah, uh, the, here uh, would be already quantitative analysis, so in TMS mapping there are things which are called center of gravity, so it's like a, a surrogate measure uh, of this uh, complicated profile, we also use other metrics called, for example, this EMD, we just compare their uh, profiles. And after that, you have the report of all the uh, results of this map, uh, and you can uh, just save it in Excel file and uh, use it for report. Also, you can use it for report if you uh, have the pictures. So if you like the picture, you can use it or you can download it uh, just from here and print it or just have it in your report like that. Uh, so it's pretty much it. So there are different ways to construct and you can color code it whatever beautiful colors you prefer, but this is mostly for aesthetic purposes. Uh, and the new version is mostly just for, uh, now we have newer version. It's, this is version of from summer. Uh, so this is just MNI uh, possibility. So you can do it also for uh, different subjects or patients uh, at the moment. Mm. So you can probably, we, we can stop and go to the slides. I think just several seconds, I think, to, to, the, uh, to the end of this uh, video. So his but visualization capabilities yeah. and also we have uh, same features for visualization this TMS maps yeah. so this is a MNI version of brain so here you could see uh, two maps uh, from from two subjects inside one uh, 
coordinate space. Uh, you, you, you can compare each other. So the idea is to quantitatively compare this map so we can do test for test studies and so we compare we can compare among patients or among subjects. I think we have to stop. So Pavel will just say a couple of words how it was uh, made because he is the developer uh, and this is actually one author uh, software so he did it and we just uh, we just mostly inspire and use it. Uh, so he is just a, a clear uh, transparent uh, algorithm or procedure to create this uh, TMS maps because it's really it's from one side it's quite simple but from other side you always should think about very very uh, tiny things like uh, what, what what kind of parameters for special filter do you want to apply or what is your assumption about uh, smoothness of this MEP function above this uh, MRI structures so uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, so this is uh, one muscle and this is another muscle cortical representation and so they can be really quite well uh, uh, segregated from one from each other. Also here you, you could see uh, basic uh, parameters of TMS maps like area, volume, hotspot, position and center of gravity. So and also it's it's possible to compare uh, several maps uh, two, two maps uh, between each, each other using this uh, EMD or small resistance matrix. So uh, and here is an example of applying this uh, MNI brain normalization possibilities. So he, here you could see uh, three uh, representations of uh, different different uh, upper lip muscles. So and this is a uh, uh, probability normalized and averaged uh, maps. So here, here you could see the difference in, in at least in uh, central gravity position and hotspot positions. Uh, so here is a demonstration of uh, visualization capabilities. So you could see uh, uh, simultaneously a lot of MRI visualizations with different maps, just to uh, compare a lot of subject between each, uh, among each other. And this is uh, just a summary of all our presentation. So you could have this uh, simple graphical interface. Also, you, you could uh, have results in different uh, pictures in, in tables just to... And, uh, and also we have a new possibility to, uh, for, for group analysis, uh, to use scripts inside the software, very very simple scripts. Uh, just just uh, do not press all these buttons uh, manually. So, and all of this software information about this is available on, on our website tmsmap.ru. Are you? So it's possible just for free download it and yeah, it's it's free. It so here. we will be happy if uh, you may want to use it for your purposes. So we, we have collaborators who are already using it. We try to use it. So if anybody wants, you are more than welcome. So we are happy. It's now working with Localite, with Next Team, and uh, this is two commercial software uh, for neural navigation and also for the data. There is a free neural navigation software in Visalos from our Brazil colleagues. So they made it. It's on the GitHub. It's free. So it's also if you have a camera, you can use it. So we have this experience. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. So now we have a uh, little time for a couple of questions. Is there any question now? Yeah. 
Well, thank you for your talk. An impressive work for one guy to make the software. So uh, could you please highlight uh, uh, the advantages your software has over the software provided with... So you buy TMS, it's an expensive thing. You get some software which uh, more or less can visualize something. I'm not uh, really big into this question. So could you please highlight the advantages your software uh, g gives uh, over this? Because the, the users, they already have the software came with the TMS. Or so please. Yeah, sure. It's a very uh, practical question. So uh, for example, in, in Next Team, uh, you have software which is, for sh first of all, it's only in the computer which you're using in the lab. You cannot take it anywhere. And it does not provide pretty much any quantitative analysis. So here is quantitative analysis. Uh, so you have your uh, areas, you have your uh, coordinates, you have already calculated distances. We also came up with some uh, approaches to uh, analyze how uh, profiles are similar to each other. Uh, this is first, so it's quantitative analysis. It also possibility just to visualize data just apart from your lab. You don't want to sit. I did it like <laughs> sitting in the lab all the time uh, in, because I had to do it before this. Uh, so you can take it home or wherever. And also uh, now it provides this possibility to uh, do it in MNI version. So you can at last you have the possibility to compare. So uh, for sure there is uh, uh, some scripts uh, which you can use to do analysis for, for this and for that. There is, like we took, for the Pavel took the majority of the algorithms for normalization from SPM, so you can do it. But uh, here it's in one place, everything. And also we came up with some new types of analysis that you can use at the moment. Plus, we are trying to, like the idea to develop it for uh, online users, but this is in the future. Uh, right now, just no TMS software or neural navigation provide you with the possibility to do quantitative analysis. You just have a picture. You can take in DICOM, you can give it to a neurosurgeon, but it's just a picture. You don't have numbers. All right. One more question, or are we done? No more questions? Okay. So thank you very much again. So now we have... Morgan, speaking about using light to monitor brain activity from the macro and the nano scale. So this goes uh, really beyond what um, we have talked uh, uh, about so far. So welcome um, and thanks for being here. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for letting me speak um, in this session. Especially because, as you will shortly notice, I do not come from the field of BCI. I also do not come from the clinical field. Um, I come from neurophotonics, a field in which we use light to monitor neuronal activity and neuronal biology. Um, so with this very short and absolutely incomplete uh, overview of um, this other neurotechnology, I hope that um, I can give you some inspiration for some of your research. So. Um, you all know that there are many scales at which the brain can be studied, and I'd like to convince you that there is a lot of computation going on at every one of those different scales. And you may be more familiar with the macro scale, so the individual, the brain as an organ, or some neurocircuits, especially at the cortex. But I would like to take you down to the cellular and the synaptic level at which I am working, um, because this is where the neurotransmission actually occurs, and where the information flows from one presynaptic neuron to another. But let's start with something you know. So EEG is one of the most popular ways of commanding a BCI, but the fact that it's recording um, signals from millions of neurons at a time results in very noisy signals and the spatial resolution is really poor um, in the order of a few centimeters. So the next logical step to get better signals is to get closer to um, where the signals originate from. So by placing electrodes on the surface of the brain or by implanting a few millimeters down the electrodes with microarrays to get a better signal and a resolution of the order of the millimeter or the micrometer. For those of you working with animals, you also know that it's possible to implant those electrodes even deeper in the brain um, and having many of those very thin wires that will each have um, several recording units so that now you have a resolution in the scale of the micrometer, but also the signals are clear enough to get access to the action potential. 
Now, maybe some of you think that the action potential is like the holy grail of the neural code, um, and that if we could only understand um, you know, how the frequency of action potential codes for behavior and cognition, then we'd just have it all. But actually, how is the action potential itself encoded? Like, when does a neuron decide to fire at all? Well, this computation happens at the subcellular level. So when a neuron receives inputs from tens of other neurons, it receives it in the form of postsynaptic potentials. And those potentials have to travel down the dendrites, where a lot of filtering happens. They can be excitatory, they can be inhibitory. Um, and they will sum up in the cell body, if they ever reach it. Um, and if this sum reaches a given threshold, then this neuron will fire an action potential. So in order to study those subthreshold potentials, regardless of whether there was an action potential or not, uh, we use the patch clamp technique. In this case, the electrode is directly in contact with the inside of a single neuron. Um, this can be done in vivo, but it's mostly routinely done in brain slices because it's less challenging, or in even more simplified systems such as dispersed um, neurons in a glass cover slip. In those simplified systems, you can go in to an even lower scale and record even smaller currents that do not originate from a synapse that was stimulated by an action potential, but actually that has simply spontaneously released a single quantum of neurotransmitters. So maybe I haven't taught you much about electrical activity of the brain so far, um, and I can probably safely assume that you've all seen this kind of cartoon representation of a synapse, um, but my representation, my view of a synapse, is much more complex as a biologist, um, because this is a completely filled presynapse and a really complex postsynapse, um, where a lot of intracellular compartments are crowded in a very tiny space, and these compartments orchestrate neurotransmission and transform an electrical signal into a chemical signal. And you may think, well, this is very crowded, but there is a lot of empty space. Well, think again, because this empty space is packed with proteins, and those proteins are responsible for the timing and the movements of those intracellular compartments. Now, you may think that proteins are only in your muscles, but they're actually in every single cell of your body, in and out, everywhere. Um, actually, you know some proteins without really knowing they are, like hemoglobin in your blood or antibodies in your immune system. But there's a protein that you probably haven't heard of unless you've read some neuroscientific literature, and that is the green fluorescent protein. It was originally discovered in the jellyfish. That's why jellyfish glow. Um, and a wonderful advantage of proteins is that they are encoded by DNA, and DNA is shared throughout the entire living realm. And that means that you can transfer a gene that was found in the jellyfish into any organism. So in this case, the mouse expresses the green fluorescent protein in every single cell of its body, but you can use some genetic targeting to express this green fluorescent protein specifically in a given cell type. So in our case, we'll express it in neurons, and you can use the, advance, the, the advances of microscopy um, to image ever deeper and ever smaller structures, such as here, half a synapse, like this is a postsynaptic spine. But you guys are not um, looking at the morphology of neurons, you want to know about their activity. So how can we use the green fluorescent protein to probe neuronal activity? Well, to get there, I need to tell you a little bit of how the signal it transformed from electrical to chemical. So when an action potential reaches a presynapse, it um, will dock some vesicles, which will release neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters will be sensed on the postsynaptic neuron by receptors that will open in response and let some ions flow inside the postsynaptic cells. These ions are the postsynaptic currents that you are recording, um, but chemically speaking, they are sensed by an intracellular receptor, which will respond again by releasing another substance, in this case, calcium. And some of the wonders of protein engineering is that we can make them sensible, sensitive to their environment, and we can make a calcium sensor, which will mean that in the resting state, the green fluorescent protein will be dark, it will not emit any photons, but when calcium is around, it will start to emit light. So in short, we can transform an electrical current into a light signal. And this is how we can monitor electrical activity to every single scale that you are used to uh, monitoring electrical ac uh, neuronal activity. So this would be the same kind of resolution as EEG. So you're having a camera uh, on top of um, the head of a, an animal, and you can see the brain when the blood vessels, and you can see neuronal activity with neurons firing all over the brain. You can get better resolution if you get the microscope closer to the skull, so you can make a window of imaging on top of the skull, and um, all these flashes of light are single neurons uh, firing an action potential, and with image analysis, you can now start studying neuronal networks um, when they fire together and when they don't, 
And you can do this like over days or months. Um, and you can do this uh, more or less deep in the brain because you can insert like an optical fiber and use a, a nanoscope. Um, but again, we can go even further in the computation in the nanoscale. Um, well, this is the microscale. And again, the green flashes are calcium signals. Um, and you are now seeing that synapses can be individually um, uh, excited. And some of the signals will never reach the cell body, so will never be recorded by an electrode. Um, only the ones that actually travel through the entire dendrite will be detectable. But using photonics, you can see that there's a lot of filtering already happening in those very, very tiny protrusions. And this will be my last example, the one, uh, the scale at which I am personally working. So here, the postsynaptic neuron is green. It's not a calcium sensor, it's just always green. What we are going to look at are single neurotransmitter receptors. Um, so if we were to tag the green fluorescent protein to a single receptor, um, you wouldn't get enough photons to detect it. So we tag it with a um, nanoparticle that is fluorescent, that is much brighter. And this nanoparticle will be able to follow the receptor as it moves in the synapse or even out of the synapse. So this is what you're seeing here. You can see those red dots moving around. Um, some are along the dendrites. Some will um, be stuck in the synapses. Some will enter or exit the synapses. And um, what I'm trying to do is, on one hand, get always brighter light emitters so that we can see deeper in the brain. And also, uh, I'm interested in knowing whether the movement of those receptors are affected um, between a healthy brain or new, uh, like disease models like Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia. So in conclusion, I'd like, uh, I hope that I convinced you that light um, is also a very interesting means of studying neuronal activity. And I will start with uh, the question session on my own. Um, would you guys be interested in um, developing an optical BCI? Would it uh, be relevant to um, even combine electrical activity and optical information to improve um, the um, quality of your BCIs? And of course, there will be like different um, um, issues to overcome, especially the fact that we require some genetic engineering, which so far has some ethical issues in humans. Um, but maybe the advantages are worth it, um, especially when you consider the possibility of genetic targeting, meaning um, imagine that you are sure that your signal is only coming from neurons and not from muscles, or only coming uh, specifically from excitatory neurons or specifically from inhibitory neurons. Or even in the case of disease, you could study specifically neurons that um, produce serotonin, which are the first ones to die in um, Parkinson's disease. Um, and also, you could have another modality to filter your signals, um, that is, the color of the light you're using. I only told you about the green fluorescent protein, but we have the entire rainbow of colors going from UV to infrared. Um, so you could imagine having green projections coming from the prefrontal cortex where decision-making is made, and you could have red projections coming from dopaminergic neurons, which code for um, motivation. Um, and then you'd be recording regular electrical activity and filter by the source of the input, thanks to the color. And of course, there are many things to discuss, and I hope that this was inspiring. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's very exciting research. So I think there are maybe some questions, but we really need to speed up now, because we have four more talks to go through. Thank you. I, I'm very naive in that, but it looks absolutely fantastic. I just wonder, uh, are there any technology of this, uh, not on rats, but on big animals, like monkeys? Anybody is working on that? And yeah. so... Yeah, yeah so um, once you have the technology for mammals, so once you have it for mice, you theoretically have it for um, like any primate and even the human. Um, so it is uh, currently like the major aim of the Brain Minds project in Japan, where they are trying to bring like all of the genetic technology existing in mice to um, the monkey, and it's 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 working. It just has to be done. Yes, and I mean there are some startups in the U.S. who are also working into this direction. So there is this open water startup. Um, but obviously they need to use light that actually goes through the bone, so that's mainly the near-infrared light. So there are a couple of um, companies who are going into this, and also Facebook was very interested in using light for um, speech uh, decoding, but uh, yeah, we don't know really what, where, where they are now with this. Are there any more questions? Short. 
Okay, a short question. When you showed this uh, channel, there were the single, we heard this uh, single channels, these red dots, or channel clusters or something. Are there hundreds of channels or single channels? Um, well, um, this is a really hot topic. It was just discovered a few years ago that, um, so if I'm not mistaken, the average is there are about three what we call nano domains per excitatory synapse on average, two to three. Um, and there are something like five to seven single receptors per domain. So, I mean, of course, there are also silent synapses that don't have any of those um, receptors, but in the healthy adult um, brain in some areas, like the cortex and the hippocampus, it would be around like less than 10 receptors per excitatory synapse. Okay, and I don't have the numbers for inhibitory synapse, but yeah. we can do it. Uh, thanks for the talk. Absolutely fantastic data. Looks like a very rich and uh, with information. Uh, one quick question, maybe not so quick answer, but <laughs> uh, how do you process this data? What is the state of the art and uh, what kind of inferences you can draw for, from, from it yeah. at the moment? Well, this is where we actually really need you guys. Like, biologists are useless with mathematics, so we're really bad with um, image analysis and processing all this enormous data. We have the same issues as you, we just have too much. Um, so, of course, like, um, bioinformatics is increasing and there's um, a lot of, of data analysis being done. Um, some people are talking about applying deep learning for microscopy images. Um, it's, it's, it's really difficult and so far, um, like, I'm, I'm working at the single molecule level, so it's very tiny. I just have a few receptors to follow per field of view. But you can imagine if you're following, like, months of data in, in mice that are, have, like, hundreds of neurons firing every millisecond, um, this is just huge. And, yeah, they are, the algorithms are being developed, but it's definitely not mature yet. All right. I'm sure we will hear more about this in the next Amara meeting. So thank again, thanks again for uh, your presentation. So our next speaker is um, Mikhail Sinkin, and um, he's talking about invasive and non-invasive brain mapping in clinical practice. So um, welcome, Mikhail. I hope they've set up your presentation here. Okay.
Questions? We have a few minutes for questions. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you. So now uh, there is Alexander Sakharov talking about some preliminary results of the research of e efficiency of the technique of, of virtual reality for restoration of motor function. So welcome and um, thanks for being here.
So I'm not sure whether Sana. Shanna, you are here. Okay, welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, Shanna will talk about the neurophysiological effects of motor training with game feedback. So um, we talked about the motivational factor is a very important factor, I think. Uh, when I come to rehabilitation hospitals, sometimes they buy a robot for 50 to 70,000, and then I come and the patients are actually sleeping, and the, move, and the hand is moving <laughs> back and forth. So. To really engage people is a, a big uh, point in rehabilitation, especially because uh, there is also something we call fatigue, post-stroke fatigue, and this needs to be uh, accounted for. So um, I'm very curious to hear about how to imp implement game uh, features in this kind of rehabilitation. Okay, uh, I will try to speak in English and very shortly. Uh, nowadays it's important to develop uh, clinical application for rehabilitation training based on BCIE. And um, our <coughs> aims of our study was to test the, our re rehabilitation procedure uh, with game feedback, uh, our uh, BCI technology and uh, our program and our... Um, e uh, the second aim was to evaluate changes of neurophysiological parameters such as EG uh, after training session. Uh, here you can see uh, our interface and timeline of uh, training session. First, we collect the data for training uh, classifier, and after that we can uh, use game feedback. Uh, <coughs> We use very uh, short trials and uh, classify, uh, class, uh, classificate short trials of movement. <coughs> we use uh, motor imagery, right and left hand, <coughs> and uh, we set the <coughs> rhythm for imagery. <coughs> and if we uh, use rhythmic paradigm, we can... Um, we can speak about a uh, short duration of each movement. And so uh, our interface uh, can um, automatic artifact uh, rejection and um, allow to uh, users um, to use game feedback, okay. Uh, we use uh, artificial network and SVM classifier in our <coughs> in our qualifier, and here our game feedback. So um, participant can uh, image left or right uh, movement, and uh, if our classifier correctly. Mm, decode uh, each single uh, short movement, the hand of, of the avatar um, go to the apples, to the graph of this. <coughs> and we can um, change the difficulty of the task by the, um, by the set of the um, quantity of a quali uh, quantity of apples and a set of uh, number of um, motor imagery needed to <coughs> graph graphs of each apple. Yeah. <coughs> so <coughs> we uh, have only ten participants after stroke who voluntarily uh, participate in our study, and we suggest them a uh, subjective estimation of the game feedback and um, here are results. Uh, so the interest was high uh, and emotional was uh, positive and uh, but uh, difficult of the task, motor imagery was uh, also high but uh, motivation for, uh, for rehabilitation uh, procedure was uh, high all uh, during all training session. Uh, here I present data only 
um, I present only five patients because uh, another uh, now is anal analyzed. Uh, uh, we uh, we done uh, EEG registration during uh, game session in um, uh, by uh, 19 uh, electrodes and uh, use only uh, motor cortex electrodes uh, nine in uh, nine electrodes and uh, did uh, wavelet analysis uh, offline after training session. And here you can see one uh, time frequency plot of one patient uh, during, training, uh, during training session. How to, we can, uh, watch what we can see. Uh, here the number of session, uh, it's only eight, uh, consists of three games each for about 10-20 uh, minutes. And um, this is um, last session versus first session. It's a difference between um, spectral power during last training session versus first. And uh, here, this time uh, of one drills, uh, one second and 200, millis uh, 200 milliseconds. And here you can see the uh, time of the uh, imagery movements. So um, we can uh, see synchronization and desynchronization effect uh, after uh, Im uh, imagination of movements. Uh, left hand and right hand. And uh, damaged hand was uh, depicted by line. So uh, these patients uh, have right hemisphere stroke and uh, damaged left hand movements. <laughs> and uh, to analyze the changes of spectral power during uh, training session, <laughs> we use a linear regression analysis in each uh, electrode for uh, several time intervals after stimulus uh, lasting uh, 300 milliseconds and uh, with a two hertz step of spectral power. So uh, here we can see that more pronounced effect uh, after uh, training session was observed in the uh, imagery movements of the right hands. And, uh, second patients uh, have a right hand damage and um, we also see the uh, changes of EEG spectral power in uh, when he uh, imaginate movements of uh, right hands and left hands also. So these patients have many uh, differences between first and last session, and uh, these patients have uh, 11 training sessions. So uh, we can um, speak about um, great uh, about pronounced EG effect after training in all patients. But uh, this effect uh, uh, was individual and uh, group analysis uh, not reveal uh, so much differences because all patients have uh, individual pattern of changes. But uh, changes of EEG uh, spectral power was more pronounced in uh, in a da damaged hemisphere in all patients. It's individual um, observation, but uh, we can conclude that 
uh, we uh, observe expected changes, uh, desynchronization in uh, mu and alpha rhythms, and synchronization in high frequency band. In, uh, for example, here we can see uh, desynchronization in uh, alpha and beta band, or in alpha band and mu band, and synchronization in beta band. Uh, for example, uh, this is a time interval, here a frequency band, and here P and F statistics. So, um, uh, we observe uh, effect uh, that we um, want to observe, and um, there is uh, a large uh, dynamic of the EEG changes in uh, damage hemisphere in all uh, patients, e, um, not about uh, using a game feedback, it's uh, advisable to use in motor rehabilitation. So, Thank you very much. Okay. So we have time for one more question because we are already... Anybody wants to ask a question? Okay. Yes, okay. Alexei. Uh, the question, when you compare the EEG power in different electrodes before the training and after the training, you put the cap, you know, new time, right? Uh, one more time, basically. How did you control for the electrode contact quality? And maybe it's more interesting, more informative to measure the ratio, let's say beta to alpha, beta to theta ratio, which would control for the impedance automatically. Maybe I missed, you know, you specified in the presentation, but I just wanted to uh, clarify. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much for being here. So this is the end of the symposium. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure to um, moderate this uh, symposium. <laughs>